this video, I'm going to talk about first degree price discrimination, probably the simplest of uh, three uh, price discrimination approaches uh, that we will see. So here is the model for first degree price discrimination. I'm going to give you two different models, one in which we have a discrete problem and the other one is, you know, the standard continuous uh, uh, model. So first off, the first degree price discrimination means the following. The monopolist knows the customers very well and the monopolist knows how much each customer is willing to pay. So the willingness to pay is a concept that we define in Intermediate Microeconomics 1. It means how much you as a customer is, are willing to pay for this good. It is not about how much money you have. You may have a lot of money, but you may not be willing to pay uh, too much for that good. So the willingness to pay is about your utility, all right? So once you buy the good, you're going to enjoy the good. So you're going to derive some utility out of this. This utility is going to give you pleasure. Anticipating this, the question is how can you translate this utility in monetary terms? So I'm going to get X amounts of X units of utility. How much does it mean to me? Five bucks. Oh, well, then you know what? My willingness to pay for this good is five bucks. If I pay more than five bucks, it's not going to worth it. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to really enjoy it that much. All right. Um, it's not about like paying something is going to give you this utility. In fact, it does. Think it this way is like I actually, by paying more uh, than my willingness to pay, I'm losing the opportunity of spending my money on other things. All right. So I have a budget, I have money, but I kind of budgeted five dollars for this. Think it this way. All right. So my willingness to pay is five dollars. I budgeted five dollars for this. I have more money, but I want to spend the rest of my money, say, having fun with my friends and, and family, you know, enjoy drinks or, or, or lunch or whatever. All right. So that's the idea of willingness to pay. And in the first degree price discrimination model, this is the uh, standard assumption, is that the monopolist knows each customer and how much each customer is willing to pay. Obviously, this is a very strong assumption and in reality, it's nearly impossible. But the standard textbook example is like, oh, you are a doctor in a small village and, you know, you grew up in this village. You know everyone uh, since your childhood. And so you know who makes how much money. And so you can charge, you can sort of uh, estimate pretty accurately each uh, household's willingness to pay and so charge different prices for your service. I think it this way. Makes sense. But again, in reality, in many environments, other environments, it doesn't make much sense. So here's a numerical example I have. So I have, um, say, five customers. I call them A, B, C, D, and E. All right. And their willingness to buy is $1 for customer A, $2 for customer B, $3, $4, and $5. And this is all known by the monopolist. The second example, I'm going to look at the continuous model. So I have many buyers and those many buyers is represented by the demand curve. A minus BQ. Q is the quantity. P is the price. A and B are some non-negative, I mean positive real numbers. All right. So they can't be zero. Let's suppose for simplicity, the cost of production for the monopolist is zero. There's no fixed cost. There's no marginal cost just for simplicity. What are the other assumptions? Well, the customers are going to buy one and only one good. They don't want to buy two goods. So they're going to buy one and they can't buy half a good or a quarter of a good. All right. So just one good. Uh, that makes sense, particularly for this example. And also the consumers, this is generally true in microeconomic theory, in economics, in fact, the customers are going to buy the product only if their surplus is non-negative, right? Meaning the surplus is what? My willingness to pay minus my, the, the, the actual price I pay. So the surplus, 
This is how we define surplus in economic, in economic theory. So my willingness to pay, willingness to pay, pay, minus the price is my surplus. And this surplus, as long as it's zero or positive, I'm gonna buy the product. If it is negative, I prefer not to buy the product. That's an assumption, right? A standard assumption, not question specific assumption. All right, so given all this, what does the monopoly does? Uh, what does the monopoly do? I'm sorry. Well, the monopolist is going to charge five different prices here. The price for customer A is gonna be a dollar. Price for customer B is gonna be $2 because this is her willingness to pay. Price for customer C is gonna be $3 because this is her willingness to pay. Price for D is gonna be $4 and price for customer E is gonna be $5. So it's exactly the same good, all right? A marker. And this marker is gonna be sold to customer A, $1 customer B $2 and so on. Well, why do they buy it? Well, because customer E, well, rich doesn't really care much about the, or really needs the marker. So for that reason, willing to pay $5 for it. So why not charge $5, All right, That's the idea. Um, well, here obviously, because it's a continuous case, is like uh, the demand curve is gonna look something like this. All right, uh, so this is the price, this is the quantity, this is the price, so this is the inverse demand curve. So it's A minus BQ, meaning if Q is zero, this intercept is A, and this intercept is when P is zero, this intercept is equal to A over B. So there are infinitely many customers. The thing is though, each customer is going to pay his or her willingness to pay. What does that mean? So when I look at a demand curve, I kind of see that all the quantities here represent a customer, all right? So a customer, for example, sitting at point zero, zero is a customer who is willing to pay nothing for this good. The customer who is sitting right here, he is the one, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just the opposite. The customer sitting at zero, zero is the one that is willing to pay the highest, A dollars. And the customer sitting at this point a over B is the one who is willing to pay zero dollars for this good. And a customer, for example, sitting at this point has willingness to pay this much, whatever this price uh, corresponds to. All right. So these quantities represents the customer. That's how I interpret the demand curve and their willingness to pay. I kind of rank the customers in a decreasing fashion is like the highest willingness to pay customer and then the lowest willingness to pay customers. And so there's gonna be, in a sense, infinitely, so infinitely many customers and infinitely many prices, all right? Think it that way. Not so realistic, more realistic. For that reason, I gave the uh, discrete problem. Well, here, the question is, what is the consumer surplus? And then I'm gonna do the same thing for the continuous case. Well, the consumer surplus will always be zero in the first degree price discrimination. Why? Well, because customer one, uh, customer A, willingness to pay $1, the actual price, she pays a dollar, one minus one zero, her surplus. Customer B uh, pays $2, willingness to pay $2, surplus zero. All right, so the, add all the customer surpluses, I'm gonna get zero. So the customer surplus in first degree price discrimination is always zero. The producer surplus, however, is positive, right? So the producer surplus is the price, so this is the surplus for customer, and then the producer surplus, so the customer surplus, producer surplus, uh, price minus cost in this simple model, all right? And the cost is zero, by the way. So therefore, the, this is profit, all right? At least in this simple model. So the producer is gonna get, or the seller is gonna get $1 from customer A, $2 from customer B, and remember, the, the cost is always zero. 
and then three dollars from customer three uh, B C I'm sorry four dollars from customer D and five dollars from customer E that adds up to nine twelve fourteen fifteen dollars I mean we usually do not use any unit for surplus but you can just say 15 is the producer surplus well what is the total surplus in this model well it's exactly 15 so that's an efficient therefore uh, scenario so the first degree price discrimination is as efficient as the perfectly competitive market meaning the entire cake entire total surplus is distributed between the buyers and the sellers it happens that the seller gets the whole cake and the consumers get nothing so it's pretty unfair but it's efficient well in a uh, continuous case what would be the consumer surplus still zero producer surplus the price um, well obviously here the, there are infinitely many prices all right so what happens is that the total surplus is is this area all right that would be the uh, producer surplus and also total surplus all right so if we had a cost all right so let's say this is the demand curve this is quantity this is price and then we have a say a fixed cost uh, I don't know the marginal cost is this well then the total surplus would be this and therefore this is also the producer surplus so the main takeaway in the first degree price discrimination is that the monopolist is going to extract the whole total surplus the outcome is efficient as efficient as the competitive market uh, and then um, the total surplus is equal to the producer surplus all right so that's the main takeaway i hope that was clear